yeah. and I do not need a microphone. Um, welcome to Middlesex University for the third ESRC Green Criminology Research Seminar Series. We have a packed program for tonight, which I'm going to gently guide you through, um, with three excellent speakers. Um, and by way of introduction, I'd like to introduce our Dean of the School of Law, who's going to say a few words before we kick off. Thank you, Angus. Hi, my name is Joshua Castellino, and I'm, as Angus has said, Dean of the School of Law, and it falls to me really to welcome you to Middlesex University and take a minute or so just to tell you about the School of Law, because I'm afraid I can't miss this opportunity of a captive audience. Uh, the School of Law is brand new. It's the, the, the university, until last year, had four schools, but essentially, in, in keeping with its new direction, which is much more research intensive, we've moved towards creating a new school of law, which brings together the subjects of law, criminology, sociology, politics, and, and international development. And the school of law itself is about 70 strong, and consists of these two major departments. It also has uh, the European Human Rights Advocacy Center, which has won about 90 cases against the mainly against the government of Russia, but we're not allowed to say that, against several different countries at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, we also have a social policy research center, which looks at issues around migration and diversity. And of course, in, in many ways, our, our big thrust has been on doctoral students. So we have a doctoral institute, and we have nearly 90 PhD students who are exploring a range of different topics at the school. So it's a thriving new school uh, with, a, with an ambitious vision at a time, I think, when higher education is, is reading and going backwards in quite many directions, we've invested very strongly. And one of our investments you have before you, guiding you expertly through this particular seminar. So we were delighted to welcome Angus to the school, uh, what, about three months ago? The interview, anyway, and about a month ago, I think, in, in practice. A bit, a bit over, yeah. A bit over. And of course, Angus has been working on these particular issues, and we thought it's a fantastic opportunity for. To, to introduce him to a wider audience under a Middlesex tag. So it's great pleasure to, to introduce Angus back to you in, in this particular setting. And I think Angus has ambitions for what we can do with green criminology here. And I'm, I'm hoping that through this, this session today, you'll be able to explore some of that as well and put this really on the agenda and the way that many other green issues are on agendas and other disciplines. I know for you it probably is very central to your agenda, but I think getting it recognized in a more mainstream way within our discipline would be very useful. And having people with this much energy here with us gives us an opportunity to play some part in that debate. I won't say any more, it's a warm day. It's, 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 this is usually summer in Middlesex, it's always like this. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to sell it when we can, I think. I, I wish you a great half day session. I hope you enjoy it. And I'm sure that Angus will expertly guide you through it. And I've actually had the pleasure of already hearing Joe, Joe speak before at a debate we did here on, on fox hunting a few months ago, which was animated. So I, I'm sure you're under that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Angus. Thank you. Okay, we have three speakers today. You've got a running order in the delegate packs that have been handed out. Uh, and I'm delighted that we have a, a mix of speakers for this session. So our first speaker is Joe Duckworth from the League Against Cool Sports followed by Keith Vincent from the Law Commission. Then we're going to have a break, and then later on this afternoon, Professor Piers Byrne. That's not at all distracting. Um, so without further ado, Joe Duckworth from the Against Coast Well, thanks, thanks, thanks Angus for inviting us, and thanks Joshua for inviting us back again. Um, I hope um, it was a lively debate last time. I was debating with a guy called Jim Barrington, with the Countryside Alliance, who, uh, who used to work for the League and uh, 20 years ago uh, started supping with the devil and uh, joined the Countryside Alliance. And um, he never mentions that now, he still refers back to his time as the League and describes himself in the League. And I'm sure that's because uh, he's completely embarrassed about what he's been doing over the last 20 years. And uh, I'm sure his writhing conscious, uh, conscience uh, keeps him awake at night. Um, it was an interesting debate. It was informed on one side, mine. Uh, on the other side, it was, it was mere assertion and justification. That is the objective view. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good debate. Thank you. Yeah. I hope, well, I hope this is controversial today as well. So it's good, good fun. Um, right, I'm going to basically talk about zero tolerance, about wildlife crime, what we're doing. But first of all, about the league. Um, the league is a charity. Um, it was formed um, uh, 89 years ago, uh, and it's, um, uh, it's got its 90th anniversary next year, 
We're the bastard child of the RSPCA. Um, we, uh, it was a bunch of vicars um, uh, who were fed up with the RSPCA being pro-blood sports and pro-field field sports. And at the time, we couldn't get the RSPCA to change that, so they set up the League Against Cruel Sports. And our, our first um, uh, trustees meeting shows a, a bunch of vicars sat in an orchard um, having their first meeting. You know. um, so we've got a glorious past, and I, I think we played a vital role in, in getting the hunting out. Um, we are a charity, so we're non-party political. We work with all political parties. And we, have, we have two broad aims. One is to uh, campaign to defend and change the law uh, to protect wild animals. Um, actually, it's not just wild animals, but it's uh, those animals affected by cruel sports. Um, and it includes, beyond that, we have actually got a conservation, education, and animal welfare broad brief, but we try and stick to uh, cruel sports. Um, and we do that by uh, working in Westminster and the devolved nations, uh, and we also do that by raising public awareness uh, of what goes on out there, and then uh, enhancing that and focusing it in on legislators and uh, thought leaders like yourselves. So I'm really pleased to be here. Our other side, which I'm going to talk about today, is our investigations and prosecution side. Um, we have two. Uh, types of investigation we do. Uh, one is where we investigate and expose cruelty which may still be legal. And so um, later in the year you'll see a range of stuff coming from us on, for example, the shooting industry uh, and stuff like that where we've been uh, active on the continent uh, where game birds, for example, are reared uh, in awful conditions and shipped over here. Uh, and 40 million of them uh, are released every year in our woodlands uh, just to be shot for sport and there's going to be a lot of that going on um, over the coming, uh, coming uh, months. Um, what I want to talk about is our investigations against people who break existing laws and trying to get them uh, into the courts and to try and sentence. And that's what I want to focus on today. Um, now we don't just focus on the Hunting Act. Um, uh, we do spend about 60% of our time investigating hunting act cases, and that includes, don't forget, it's not just foxes, it's deer, um, it's um, hare, and that's not just hare coursing, it's hare hunting, that still takes place, uh, and it's also a mink. Uh, and just to let you know, although otter, otters are protected in various other ways, a lot of these mink packs changed to mink packs when otters started declining. Um, in the West Country, some of them have started changing their names back to water packs. Um, so, just shows the, uh, the ingrained culture of these, thing, the, these, these things. Um, can I just say as well, we don't, uh, as well as not just looking at wildlife waste legislation, we, um, we, we, we take the Al Capone theory here, you know, he was not done for, um, for gangsterism, he was done for tax evasion. And so, if we can get these people on anything else, we do. And they tend to break lots of other laws as well as um, uh, wild animal welfare laws. Uh, how do I do this? Either click That's down or use the mouse to just click on next. Um, oh no, it's there. Look. That's it. That's what it says. Mark. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I'm an Apple Mac man myself. So right. Let's, um... Right. Um, Let's talk about um, what, what we see out there. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is hunting with dogs, um, which again is not just um, fox hunters and things like that. There's a growing uh, thing about lads with dogs, which I'll, which I'll come on to, it's informal hunting. We look at badger persecution. Um, the people who <coughs> are being persecuted badgers tend to be the same people who are the terry men for fox hunting, um, and they enjoy digging out. Um, uh, well, they disturb badger sets to dig out foxes, but they are also often engaged in, uh, in badger baiting as well. Uh, issues around snaring and trapping. Um, and uh, just to let you know on, on snaring and trapping, and I'll come back to that in a minute, and, and also this is related to per per raptor persecution as well. Because the same people, and it tends to be around shooting states, the same people who are poisoning raptors are the same ones who are laying illegal snares. Uh, all around our countryside, and DEFRA have published a report um, uh, quite some time ago, and kept it quite quiet, um, which showed that um, actually at any one time there's, there's up to 250, 
thousand snares out there. Uh, this is DEFRA's own figure. Now, um, <coughs> on average, a snare catches an animal once every 20 days. So, as we're sitting out now, now, just do the arithmetic. And out there, as we speak now, there are thousands of animals actually stuck in snares. And believe you to me, they're the most inhumane, horrible things going. Uh, we're going to get snares banned. And to tell you the truth, that would do more for wild animal welfare than the hunting act would. Because there are more animal, wild animals damaged by snares than there are by, by, ever by hunting with dogs. Um, it's also around shooting. Um, there's a lot of <coughs> shooting goes on, uh, not just for poaching, but for, uh, for sporting purposes as well. Um, and there's also a huge amount of habitat damage um, and disturbance that gets done by these people. So, um, how common is it? The first thing I'll say is that wildlife crime is probably the most under-recorded recorded crime uh, that you can come across. Um, it's non-recordable except I think it's for two particular things, which tend to be to do with CITES-related things. So they tend to be doing with, uh, you know, with um, uh, international wildlife crime. In terms of domestic wildlife crime, it's not recordable. So um, in terms of police forces deciding on intelligence, what they should focus on. Um, there's, a, there's an underplaying of, of, um, of wildlife crime, the amount of police resource that gets played uh, to do to that. Um, in terms of uh, our uh, reporting, and I'll come on to how we operate in a minute, um, we've seen uh, an increase uh, of 37.54% in the number of uh, recorded inc incidents of wildlife crime. Uh, and that is uh, for this, so far this year compared to the same period last year. So we're picking up a lot more um, reports on this. And this is not just, oh, I've seen a, you know, uh, a bloke in a red coat on a horse. This is actually where there's a reasonable um, justification for saying that there's some form of wildlife crime going on. Um, now, um, we've also, for example, seen, I'll give you some examples of this, when you start looking for it, there's been a 20% increase in, in hair coursing um, uh, coming through. And, uh, this is great because they, uh, in, Nor uh, in Lincolnshire, north from those areas where hair is quite prevalent, the police have actually seen this as a major, major issue. And we pick up intelligence of people travelling from as far as Manchester and Birmingham and places like that to go hair coursing in these areas. And it's all often related to gambling. Uh, but it's often related to other forms of crime like theft and all the rest of it. It's very much linked in with a lot of um, you know, farm machinery, farm diesel, all these sorts of things being nicked while these people are down there. So how's it changing? Um, we've seen, first of all, um, we've seen a, a, an increase in um, formal plant stuff. Uh, and uh, within that, we've seen a great increase in hare hunting cases, illegal hare hunting cases. And these are often um, packs, uh, beetle packs, which are associated with quite prestigious organisations and often army regiments, for example. So, uh, for example, the Royal Agricultural College, um, you know, we're, we're taking cases against them shortly. Um, places like Stowe School. All these sorts of places still have beetle packs and are still going out hare, hare hunting with these packs. And they're the sort of things that um, uh, probably been going on all the time because uh, it's only recently that we've, we've turned our attention to them. And for example, the Hunt Saboteurs Association very rarely sabbed these things. So they've gone on and let fox hunters take all the, you know, all the stick and they've just gone on quiet and carried on doing what they've always been doing. Um, <coughs> the other thing we, we see is um, a, a, great, a, a really massive increase in animal cruelty related to social media. Um, uh, not just on open Facebook and things like that, but they often have these closed networks which we do manage to break into. And uh, it tends to be the lads with dogs type thing. Uh, and um, you wouldn't believe some of the horror that they like to brag about. Um, and uh, there was a case uh, based on our intelligence uh, uh, up in Grimsby recently when three men pleaded guilty to a total of 30 charges under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, Animal Welfare Act, and Protection of Badges Act. And they were uh, got custodial sentences, and that was all based on uh, us uh, infiltrating into one of these social networks uh, that are specifically linked around that. They're often linked as well with um, uh, 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 puppy farming, 
and developing new breeds. So I don't know how many of you have seen uh, bull lurchers. Yes, there's one nod at the back there. Um, this is where they, uh, they cross lurchers with sight hounds. So unlike uh, fox hounds, they chase by looking, watching the thing rather than smelling it. Uh, and they've got speed. And they crossbred then with pit bulls, um, so that they've got the, the muscle and the aggression and the strength. And there's an international trade in these dogs. Um, uh, we, we were following stuff between Scotland and Ireland uh, and ourselves all the time around this. So there's a whole infrastructure building up around these new lads with dogs type uh, hunters. They're often also involved in firearms as well. They often take guns with them when they go out as well. Um, so we're seeing all this happening all around us, and it's quite worrying because uh, we, we see it performing and adapting, and I'll come to, uh, back to that in the hunting uh, in a minute. We also um, find that it is linked with other forms of crime. Sorry, what's that? I can't read that. The one on the right. The one on the right. Yeah. What's that last sort of thing say? I don't know. Oh, well, linked to other crime. Um, now, we, we had a seminar about four years ago where we got people like the FBI over and various things like this. And um, we published a series of papers which um, I'm quite willing, if through Angus, we can give the, the reference to. And um, that was all around the link between um, animal abuse and human violence. And there are clear demonstra demonstrable links between um, exposure and participation in uh, animal abuse leading to human violence. And, um, the research that was done um, by uh, the FBI, is it called, I can't remember. Bradley. Uh, yeah, it, and it, it, what's the Bradley. place called? It begins with Q. Quantico. That place, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, people who abuse animals are five times more likely to be involved in other forms of uh, criminality, and four times more likely to be involved in other forms of violence against humans. And certainly, um, we pick up. Um, Unfortunately, quite a lot of this stuff, uh, including uh, domestic violence and sexual abuse amongst uh, some of these people, which we pass on to the appropriate authorities. <coughs> now, how do we go about this? Because don't forget, we're an NGO, we're a charity, we're not a police force. We've invested over a million pounds in um, recruiting and training uh, investigators. Um, they uh, uh, are primarily ex-police officers um, and we've been training them in the field up until January this year and then the team went live from January um, to the end of the hunting season uh, which is in March. Um, we also have invested quite significantly in um, our intelligence um, uh, ability and so uh, we use what's called the National Intelligence Model. Uh, it's, it's just morphing and changing into something else at the moment. And we use that to analyse our uh, uh, data and information we get in, to evaluate it, um, uh, to manage our sources and various other things like that. And uh, the majority of our operations are intelligence-led. Um, because to tell you the truth, there's far too much stuff going on out there. And on our own, you know, well, we're not on our own because we work in partnership, but even with the partners, it's very, there's far too much for us to do. So we do target um, down to particular people, particular hunts, particular places and particular times, so that we can maximise our clout. It does also help us with partnership working. Um, ourselves, the RSPB, the RSPCA, all use that same intelligence model, and we swap information between us. And so we collaborate at intelligence level, and also increasingly at operational level as well. We also share this information with the police. So we do work in partnership with the uh, National Wildlife Crime Unit as well. But to tell you the truth, we've got uh, significantly more resources, believe it or not, the National Wildlife Crime Unit, um, which is a sad thing because really we shouldn't be having to spend money on this, to tell you the truth. Uh, but we have to. Um, and uh, for example, our head of uh, intelligence is uh, who also um, manages our covert work on the other side of the uh, uh, investigations is an ex senior special branch officer. So, what we're increasingly doing is professionalising this whole, whole area, and it's really important because 
it makes us more effective, but also it engages the police and the Crown Prosecution Service much, much better. And that was improving rapidly all the time. I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, um, the bottom one there is, is human rights, because um, we do covertly film people. Uh, and also, um, uh, if we have intelligence that law breaking is going on private property, we trespass as well. Um, uh, and we're very careful about when we do that, we do risk analysis and all the rest of it for all our operations. We only do that when it's absolutely necessary and justified. But we are very careful of, of things like that. And so, although Ripper, for example, doesn't apply to us, we behave as though it does. Um, we are very compliant with um, the Data Protection Act and all these sorts of things. And we only store information on individuals if, one, they've already been convicted, and two, they're part of an ongoing current investigation. So we do try, because we do have responsibilities here and want to be an ethical organisation. And although we're not covered by these laws, we do try and behave as though we are covered. Um, and so how, how do we operate? We, we operate um, uh, differently than, the, than um, other organisations like the RSPCA. Um, first of all, um, uh, our information sources include um, our hotline, we have a, a wildlife crime hotline and we get stuff from that. That is staffed by, again, ex-police officers who used to operate 999 members, so we're making sure that we look after victims, because there are a few human victims here, but also make sure we get the maximum information out of them that's useful. Um, we um, also have uh, people within hunts, uh, and we have covert sources, hundreds of covert sources, um, which we uh, get information from, which we have to protect because they can often be at risk from these people if it's discovered what they're doing. So uh, again, we are very careful with that, and we're lucky that we've got people working for us who've managed covert resources in the past, and we do look after them as best we can. Um, we um, then turn that into intelligence, as I've said, and um, most of our work is then intelligence-led. I have to say we're opportunistic as well. Somebody rings us up and says somebody's going to go, you know, hair hunting here at this time, and it's a source. We'll switch our resources straight away and go and try and catch them. Um, and then we feed that through to our operations teams, which are spread all over the country. Um, but when we're doing an operation, we often field at least three teams of two to try and catch these people, at least three teams of two. And I don't know if you've seen the press, we've also. Um, we also use UAVs as now as well now, uh, drones. They're unarmed, by the way. Um, <laughs> but um, we do use drones um, as well in certain circumstances, which is to put the wind up more often. So because not only do they have to look under bushes now, they also have to look in the sky to see what they're watching. Um, and also then, what we do is we um, uh, get get the evidence. We uh, put it into uh, a form which the police would do before they took the case to the CPS. And uh, we, we, not, we, we are very, very careful of only putting through strong cases. Because it's not in our interest to um, put in weak cases. We then work with the police and then through the CPS. And I'll come on to that a bit later about all the issues and problems are with it. Um, Right, what are the results? Um, it certainly has had a deterrence effect because at the, at the end of the day, all we want to do is stop this. Right? Um, although the Hunting Act is important, the Hunting Act is not the end, it's the means to the end. What we just want to stop is this cruelty that's going out there. And it's difficult to judge how effective we're being, uh, but there are some indicators. At the um, AGM of the Masters of Foxhounds, um, the last one, uh, most of the AGM was taken up talking about us, right, so, which is great. So obviously we are making some impact there if they're not bothered about us. The other is the increasing amount of noise from the countryside lights. Um, and that is increasing um, and some of it 
not nice, to tell you the truth. Um, for example, there's been a campaign against me and the president of the league accusing us of being paedophiles on the uh, social media, um, which is really nice, but that's the sort of thing these people do. Um, but more importantly, what we're seeing is there are a number of hunts folding or merging. Um, so then, although there's all this every boxing there, there's this thing, there's hundreds of thousands of people out and join fox hunting and the rest of it. Um, uh, even Horse and Hound had an article and guidance about how you should merge your hunts. You know, uh, and they are under financial difficulty. I know the Surrey Union has lost a major, and in fact, turn we're trying to merge with the Crawley and Horsham hunt. Um, I know uh, other hunts have actually folded. I know that the Cornstalk Stag Hounds have, I think it's 17 pounds in their bank account. Um, so they, we are, you know, they, they are really struggling with this. Um, they're also converting to uh, uh, non-lethal hunting, which is great. We've got no problem with them dressing up, getting drunk and enjoying themselves on their horses. Well, we just don't want to see them killing a wild animal at the end of it. And for example, the Isle of Wight hunt has, de has, um, has declared that it's going to start drag hunting for the next season, which is great because that is not using non fox based scents uh, and uh, using NC trails and things like this. Uh, and that's a result for us. That's great because the Isle of Wight used to be an awful, cruel, uh, brutal place. On prosecutions, um, um, it's not just the hunting act we go for, for example. I'll give you an example of the badger persecution earlier on. Um, our prosecutions at the moment, from, um, from our investigations in three months from January to March this year, um, we have ten prosecutions in the pipeline. Um, two uh, have already gone through, and um, uh, eight people have been charged from those two incidents. And that's under the Hunting Act, the Badgers Act, and also the Animal Welfare Act. Um, so that's the first two. Unfortunately, we had one against the Quantock Staghounds, uh, who are a particularly nasty bunch of people. Um, and the complex case units of the Crown Prosecution Service said there was a case. And then when they handed it down to the local CPS, they said there wasn't. Um, one case we have handed to the RSPCA is we also work with the RSPCA on prosecutions. Um, they do private prosecutions, we don't. Um, but where we, uh, they were already in a private prosecutor hunt, and this was about that particular hunt, so we have given our case to them so that they can use it now. And then the other ones are in the process of uh, various stages going through the police and CPS. So I expect, just from those three, um, three months, we're going to get, I, I would say, a minimum of 20 people in the course, um, which I think is a, a good result. It's by far not enough because the, the, the prevalence and ubiquity of law breaking uh, in this area is huge. Um, we also um, have to say we're um, working with the police force, for example, um, uh, uh, in a joint operation around hair coursing. Um, uh, because as uh, the done a pretty good job of policing in the east of England. They've, uh, the, the, the crime has moved out to the neighbouring areas. Now, because these people stop going to Lincolnshire, they start going to Cambridgeshire and places like that. And uh, there'll be more prosecutions coming forward on the hair coursing side. Uh, on the lads with dogs side, I have to say that um, we've had a number of prosecutions here, but we, want, we, we really need to invest more in the uh, investigations around social media. Um, because this is how they are working together around this, and we have uh, like to invest more in there. So, what we've also seen is the hunters changing their behaviour. Um, that I should, before we move on, the Haythrop prosecution that the RSPCA did was a landmark prosecution. Because uh, for the first time, it was under the corporate uh, element of the hunting act. Uh, in the past, it's been individual hunters that have been prosecuting. This was the hunt itself. So it was clear that they were conspiring to break the law, and that's where they thought was important. And in terms of the hunters changing their behaviour, um, with ourselves in the RSPCA and I4 as well uh, onto them, they've become much more secretive and much more closed. Um, uh, they don't tell you, they used to publish meat cards and things like that, so they've become much more secretive, much more. In, 
uh, 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 you know, sort of closed groups of people. Um, we also find that um, they're now taking counter-surveillance measures against us. Um, and so they've engaged some ex-military intelligence people to advise them on this, and they use what's called the box system to try and um, counter our stuff, and we're countering their counter uh, 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 measures and all the rest of it. And it's fascinating, but we're better than they are, they are at it. They're also hiring um, uh, security people. Um, and um, these are not nice people, they're not registered um, people either. Um, but they're using those as well to, to uh, keep, keep us away. They also try and infiltrate us. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they offer staff, our staff, large amounts of money. Right, and things like this. And they're very active about this. Um, they're also putting pressure on the CPS uh, and ACPO and um, the Charity Commission and the Information Commissioner and various other things. So they're doing everything they possibly can to, to stop us doing these things. Um, but the main thing they've done is, uh, is they've started pretending that they're what's called trail hunting. Now, um, interestingly, um, I don't know how many of you know the Hunting Act. It's very clear in the Hunting Act. Hunting with dogs is illegal. But then there's various exemptions that they put, put in there. Some of them are completely mad, but, well, most of them are completely mad. But they've used in the past those exemptions to <laughs> avoid prosecution. Am I being too biased in this? Do you no, 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 I think, I think you're fine. Well, it's an ESRC-funded <laughs> seminar. It's supposed to be um, balanced and academic rather than... Uh, I, I think there may be a council later on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, not from me. But <laughs> <laughs> not from me. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was I saying? I've forgotten that. Uh, trail hunting. Um, now what they do is they say they were trail hunting and it was an accident. Um, now, what they do by trail hunting, uh, we've never got any footage of them actually properly laying the trail. If they see us there, what one of them does is tie a little bit of rag on the end of their riding crop and pretend to go along plastic it on the floor. Uh, so they sort of lay a trail and then they follow this trail. Now they use fox urine and often um, the crushed pads of foxes um, to um, lay this trail, I suppose a trail. And then every time we catch a fox, they say, oh, gosh, it was an accident, I'm sorry. And that's what they're using now as a defence all the time. Um, and that is the main thing that uh, the behaviour has changed on. Now, am I okay for time? <coughs> yep. What are the challenges? I think the first thing is uh, police resources and training. Um, we, we all know there's been very significant cuts in um, uh, police resources. And also, on wildlife crime, your average Bobby doesn't know much about it. You know, and um, once there are um, training courses in wildlife crime, and most authorities have wildlife crime officers, um, often those wildlife crime officers might be part-time, might have other, other duties and all the rest of it. And one of the things we do, we give free training to the police, and we do on uh, you know, all the police national training courses and to individual police forces, is what to look out for. Uh, now, increasingly, what you've got is you've got a passionate, dedicated police officer who hates wildlife crime and will probably do it in their spare time. Often they do. Um, increasingly, though, we're getting support from senior, men, uh, senior parts of the police force as well, which backs that up. And I'm pleased to say, in, in, in a number of um, police forces, in the face of all these cuts, they're actually investing in wildlife crime because they see it as absolutely critical to addressing rural crime. Um, in terms of um, the CPS, um, again, um, the um, uh, Complex Crimes Unit is pretty good on this. You know, they, they understand all the nuances about this. And you have to understand the case law. Um, because don't forget, um, a lowly terrier man for, um, I don't know, say uh, one of the hunts in the middle of nowhere. When that person ends up in court, they'll have a leading QC representing them, right, at the magistrate's court. So the CPS have to be good, right, because the other side puts significant amounts of money into this, um, over the top completely. But what we find when it gets to a local level, 
um, is that we often get blocked with the CPS. Uh, I'll give you an example of Quantock Staghound's case recently, where the complex case unit said it was a really good case. Got down to the, the, the grassroots and it, it was dropped. Now, um, you can have conspiracy theories and all the rest of it, and I'm sure some CPS officers, in fact, I could even name them, uh, are, are hunters and um, uh, go to the hunt ball and big mates with them. But the vast majority aren't. You know, it's a question of working with the CPS and bringing them up to give them the confidence to take these cases. The law and behavioural change. Um, oh. <coughs> what I think I'd say there is that um, a good strong law is necessary but not sufficient to, uh, you know, to end this behaviour. Uh, a lot of this behaviour is, is so deeply culturally ingrained that unless you have strong law, which is actually then strongly enforced, um, you will not stop that behaviour. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, snares, largely used by gamekeepers. Um, largely, um, those men, they're mostly men, are the, are the sons of gamekeepers and possibly even the grandsons of gamekeepers. And they've been brought up in a tradition and a way of doing these things, which is really, really difficult to break. So DEFRA did a report recently, not recently, the DEFRA report on the snare and the humane use of snare. And they found no compliance, they found uh, amongst gamekeepers, I think 98% of them knew about the law and the code of practice on the use of snares. Uh, and none of them said they were compliant with it. And they found no evidence of compliance when they went out into the field. And that just gives you an example, you know, that voluntary codes of practice and this sort of thing, in this area, do not work. The Hunting Act, um, it is a straightforward piece of legislation, and you have uh, groups of often influential people across the countryside who are conspiring to break the law and continue to break the law. Um, now, what we need there is uh, strong enforcement, because don't forget, this is the will of the people, and still is. 80% of people in this country don't want hunting illegal, they're made illegal, don't want it legal. Right, so you've got a small minority of people here who are just sticking two fingers up to the rest of us and carrying on with this awful cruel practice. <coughs> now, the decriminalisation risk, this is where um, Keith, I'm sure, will answer this later, but um, five minutes. Our greatest worry here is uh, on the Law Commission review is um, we have the most hostile government against um, wild animal welfare for decades. And um, the danger with the, uh, the Law Commission review is that it's all about decriminalisation and deregulation of existing wildlife law. Now, by the way, wildlife law is all over the place and is driven largely by hunting and landowning interests anyway. But it's clear that um, I know Labour, for example, would like to do something like this to tidy it up, but that animal welfare is a key driver of that, not um, helping the shooters um, to uh, uh, run their businesses better. Now the politics of it as well, I'll just, um, the politics of it is that we've got a majority in the House of Commons at the moment of over 60, so if they had a vote on it, they'd lose it. Uh, it is part of the, um, uh, um, the coalition agreement to have a uh, vote on it before 2015. Um, so we're not complacent about this at all. And I have to say, Owen Patterson, who is the current deaf minister, uh, is, uh, he's, well, he's referred to us as fascists. Uh, and uh, he is so pro-hunt and so anti-wildlife on everything you can think of that uh, I worry that they will, they'll lose their common sense. So I think if they had votes on this, most people would say with unemployment, all these other things, why are you wasting parliamentary time on this? Um, but with those people there, it's a bit of a problem. Um, I'm going to rush through this here. Um, the other thing I'd say about this that we're picking up is um, that there are huge human and community consequences around wildlife crime as well uh, that we should take into account. And, um, in a previous career, I was involved in bringing zero-tonic policing into central London. 
And I remember um, I was speaking to a woman who uh, was subject to hunt havoc and intimidation. Uh, and in the end, she had to close her business down um, uh, because of the intimidation of the hunters. And I could have been talking to a mum in a stairwell on a council block in East London um, about, uh, you know, where she had people dealing drugs in her stairwell. These people were riding roughshod literally over her land and their hounds rioting again with their livestock and then bullying and intimidating their kids at school and all this sort of thing. She felt isolated, she wondered why the powers that be weren't doing anything. Everybody knew who these people were but were frightened of saying anything about it. You know, it was the same emotions from that lady in stairwell in East London as this uh, farmer woman uh, suffering from havoc. And I think um, uh, the police have got to do something about this and prioritise it. And uh, it's a sad case that uh, only 30% of the people who ring through to Wells with this stuff have run the police. And you ask them why, it's because they haven't got confidence in the police in actually dealing with these things and sorting them out. And that includes, sadly, um, even when firearms are involved as well, which, if you think about that, somebody's breaking the law with a firearm. And the people are frightened of ringing the police up. Can you imagine that happening around here? It's quite, it's quite phenomenal what happens in the countryside. Um, now, I think the other positive side of this is the, the, the discussions I've been having with crime and um, uh, police and crime commissioners is very, very positive. Um, and we can show by all the polling, including at constituency level, where all these issues, the vast majority of people, uh, if you like, the league is representing the vast majority of people's views. And it may be that they were only elected in an 11% turnout when the, the, the was votes in. I don't care why. Um, but we are getting very, very positive stuff coming from um, uh, police and crime commissions, which fills me with hope because they set the uh, objectives for the police and the police in the plan. I and mean, in many of them, you can see it's all sections on wildlife crime, which obviously we're going to build them. So, I'll cut through that. The one thing I'd say is um, I was talking to somebody uh, yesterday who uh, is working in Africa um, with, uh, in Kenya, with lo local people um, on their dog welfare. And uh, they were saying that uh, for every place you go to, um, you go in there and you know one in four people in this village are going to die from starvation, ill health, and you know, die young. And he said, you know, why, why, what people ask often, why are you there, you know, spending money on their dogs? And uh, they made the point that, first of all, those people wanted them to, um, you know, the dogs were really important to them. Um, but the second thing is, um, uh, in Jewish society, in my view, one of the key indicators is by how they treat the weak uh, uh, and the weakest, and how they treat people with no power or no voice. And I don't think, for me, there's any difference between uh, animals and people in that. And it's a key indicator for me, and many have said this before, famous <coughs> that how we approach and how we uh, behave and value animals is a key indicator of our civil, you know, how, how we've developed our civilizations. And there's a hidden stuff in this country, a hidden cruelty that goes on out there. And I think it's, um, uh, we're, we're an advanced Western country in the 21st century. Uh, and I think it's important that we make people not turn a blind eye to this and we make sure that legislators do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. I have to admire the way that Joe subtly managed to turn five minutes into seven. Sorry. <laughs> but, but that's fine. Um, I know that you have to dash off before the end, so... No, I'm here till about five. So oh, you're here till five, okay. In that case, we'll have questions towards the end of that room for questions. Okay, um, Joe mentioned uh, strong law, and then had a quiet dig at Keith, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm which, sorry. Which, <laughs> which was anticipated. Uh, next speaker is Keith Vincent from the Law Commission. And in putting this programme together, there were a couple of things that... that Joe, can I take this out? Yeah, sure, sure. That we, we wanted to do to look at the enforcement of the role of NGOs, which some of you will know is an area of work that I, I look at, to also look at legislation and the way that law works. And this is in the context of a reform of UK wildlife legislation. Um, 
The idea, I believe, is that we will end up in 2015 or 16 with an all, all singing, all dancing, new wildlife legislation that will be the envy of the world. We won't, <laughs> uh, because there won't be parliamentary time for this to happen, I'm fairly certain. But I think Keith Vincent from the Law Commission is going to explain to you the utopian vision of our new wildlife law. No pressure. Yeah, thanks. Um, whilst I'm trying to make this work, whilst I'm trying to make this work, I'd like to say just very quickly, my favourite consultee group um, by name was, was a self-help group for those um, for farmers and others adversely affected by the RSPCA. Um, the very valuable work that the League is going to do, but, but, but you know, the next time we have a wildlife thing, there's also going to be a self-help group against the League against. The I hope so. Um, <laughs> do I need to step in between you? Two? No, no. <laughs> I'd see that as an indicator of success. Actually. Well, no, no, that was the idea. <laughs> um, however, what we do, to be fair, I've only got three slides, so I don't know why I'm bothering with that. <laughs> They're only to remind me what I'm meant to be saying. Hmm? There's people who can't see the food in the I'm not going to walk around quite as much as... You still about four miles. <laughs> I was trying to get a breeze. <laughs> right. Um, I'm very quickly going to explain who we are, just in case for those luckier of you who've never heard of the Law Commission. Um, sorry about that, I think that's going to change. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the subject, subject matter of wildlife law. I'm going to say a little bit about what we think of as the regulated community, which gives us a slightly different result, it has to be said, to the way that Joe has portrayed the world. And I'm going to look at the themes of wildlife law, and then we're going to look, turn to sanctions, which is the bit around here. Um, the Law Commission was set up in 1965, so significantly younger than Lee, um, to keep the law under review. And by in doing that, the purpose of the Law Commission is to make the law simpler, and to remove anomalies, of which there are more than a couple in wildlife law, and to appeal obsolete and unnecessary enactments, which pretty much is all of the game laws, um, and to reduce the number of separate enactments, again, something which would be quite useful. The Wildlife Project was so, um, suggested to, to us by two people, weirdly enough. Um, it was suggested by um, DEFRA, which is the obvious one, and the other one, the person who suggested it was a man who illegally um, breeds peregrine falcons in his shed in Newcastle. Um, so, it's true. We have a nice open process of consultation. People make suggestions to, to us, and um, this particular gentleman thought that he had been put into jail too, one time too many, and that the wildlife and countryside act needed appealing. So he is also a sponsor for this project. We tend to take death further more seriously of these two. I'm, I'm sorry, Derek, but um, I simply you just, you know, we were never going to help you. Um, consultation ran um, last year until the 30th of November. During consultation, we got about 488 responses, or admittedly, not, almost 300 of those were generated by the RSPB. After having told them that it's not a numbers game, then put, um, putting up a blog saying, could you all individually write to the, number, uh, to the Law Commission? Um, of the separating those out, the 114 that came, came, came from institu institutions like, um, and stakeholders, people like um, League, League or Wildlife Link or HSI separately as well, um, and individuals, academics involved, involved in it. The project I can now tell you is with um, deaf ministers to see whether it will move forward towards Bill, towards, towards us dropping the debt. So there's a small chance there wouldn't be any law, and uh, someone will have to come back and look at this again. Whatever happens, the Law Commission will report on its findings. So there will be something out of it, and uh, we will report on what we think are um, the, the essential problems with the current, current law, which are um, long, varied. Now, there are definite problems going on here. Um, State of Nature, the recently um, published reports, um, showed a 60% um, but 60 of to um, total um, uh, species sur um, surveyed have shown a decline over the last 50 years. 31% of those, of those was, um, were serious. If you look at um, certain particular species, there are now no breeding pairs of hen harriers, for instance, in the United uh, in England. Um, the last uh, so uh, 
if you did the, step back and do the scientific research on this, then out with um, persecu uh, persecution and, po and possibly some other far far uh, some farming practices. There should be significant numbers of them. It's not actually a, a, a species which has just disappeared off the planet. That has a relatively stable stable habitat. It's just that they keep getting poisoned. Um, the same is true for peregrine fal falcons. It's not we have quite a lot of those. We should have quite a lot more. And more importantly, they should be more evenly distributed than they are at the moment. You're more likely to find them on sea cliffs and things like that, where people don't tend to persecute them, as opposed to across the to totality of its available environment. Moreover, the world as Joe was very rightly portraying this. Is it's this is not you know if you just talk about poaching as a classic wildlife crime, this is not sort of Danny the Champion of the World, nor nice in the Roald Dahl book. Um, this is you know quite a serious organised crime using sophisticated tools, turning up significantly ahead of the game of any police. These are people turning up with night sights, they're looking like they just walked out of a decent blockbuster movie, not. Not turned out with you know some raisins with a little bit of sleeping drug, um, you know granny's sleeping drugs in them, um, and this has to be brought, brought into mind, brought in mind when you sort of look look at the, uh, the world. Now, when one considers the people, the thing involved, the, the the community, the most striking part about this this universe, this world, the regulated community, is the difference. You know, but at one level, yes, there's you know there's smallholders, there's people who own an individual farm, or there's a couple of kids who go go into the world and quite wrong, wrongly decide that putting one large dog and a badger next to each other uh, to each other in a phone box was a good idea and meant to film it. Um, and but at the other, the top end, then you have wind farms, you have people who operate trains, um, Na um, Royal Navy submarines disturb cetacea. Um, there is a license to allow them to operate. Uh, you know, that, that, that's the scope of human behavior. Amongst that community, there is also almost no agreement. There is no single view on wildlife. There is no one who just says, it's perfect for conservation, it's welfare is great, we should do this. There is no settled thing. This definitely came out to, to us. To give a particular example, um, welfare. Some of our, concept, um, our, our um, consultees took an approach to um, animal welfare, which essentially said, suggested that animal welfare is owed to domesticated and companion animals, not to wildlife. So the the, the duty, your relationship with with, with that, the, the the content of that almost contract, um, is in for, um, it does not include not it's not suffering. Um, Again, the, uh, the National Wildlife Crime Unit has recently put up submissions to the Sentencing Council because there is no coherence in sentencing in this area. And they said, look, again, this is the, this is the bit that you have to think about this. At one end are serious and organized um, crime, people taking you know, thousands of finches or doing things or moving very, very sophisticated bits of um, illegal product around, uh, around the world. And then, you know, there are two guys in a, you know, a, and a shotgun walking into their, lo uh, their local wood, wood with very little clue about what they're doing, or a relatively a less sophisticated gamekeeper deciding that um, stop, uh, you know, that uh, um, stopped uh, uh, snares are um, actually legal. Um, now, I'd like to say something about the activity in this area. Um, I'm going to pick 2011 because it's one of the few years where we have a reasonable st um, statistics. However, I say this as a caveat at the start, there are no good wildlife statistics. There's just no idea, there's no idea what the level of deviance is from what you're permitted to do. Um, Joe's raised it, I'm going to come back, back to it. First, 2011, 58 people were proceeded again under the Protection of Badgers Act. That will include both digging out sets, mo mostly this will be the um, digging out badger sets more than actual, um, so um, the use of badger tongs or um, kill, um, killing and taking the badger. Um, in, um, in, in, the, in the same sort of year, there's 57 Hunting Act um, uh, uh, prosecutions. Um, there are no single set of statistics for wildlife and crime. Um, um, 
Countryside Act because it's hard to de um, differentiate between species, so where I go and kill and take something, and where I've committed one of the habitats type of offences. But women in terms of birds, um, because the RSPB report on it, then the 34 um, bird uh, prosecutions in 2011. Um, but if you took a look at other species, European protected species, we have no data. There is actually no, da uh, no data set. The National Wildlife um, Crime Unit records crime, but the thing is, there's no obligation to um, send data to them. So it's only a partial figure, but again, in 2011, they reported 58 wildlife crimes. But we actually know that there's, um, not, you know, I've just given you an example of 120 of them, so there has to be a flaw in their figures somewhere. Even then, what the picture that you get is that this is nothing. I mean, if, if this were any other, and remember the range of activity that this covers, if this were any other um, sphere of human life, we'd just be looking at possibly the most compliant country, country on the planet, in the sort of area where you just go, oh, fantastic, it's all good, let's just walk away. So criminal law is not doing all of the work that it possibly could in this area. Now, at the same time, in 2011, 24 general licenses were issued by Natural England. So this is just in, uh, in England, I'm not giving the equivalent figures for licenses issued in, in Wales. General licenses allow anyone who is a member of the public within certain requirements, normally an owner or occupier of land, to shoot certain birds during parts of the, uh, parts of the year or to do other, um, other things. Um, at the same time, 10 class licenses were issued. Class licenses allow a, a group of people. So, um, Airports, for instance, an owner and operator of an airport can use one of the class licenses to kill birds to, for the protection of air safety. It's within the Wild Birds Directive. You can see why you might want to, every now and then, take or move something on the basis that you don't want it to bring down a large plane. This would be bad in very many different ways, so we allow them to kill things or take them or move them unless they're swans, in which case you need the agreement of the Crown as well as with like, the, the license. But that's just one of the more weird anomalies of our law. Um, actually, no, it's not even close to any one of the more weird anomalies <laughs> of our law. I'm sorry, that's a, it's no possible way I could ever substantiate that. Um, 18 organisations also hold licences to essentially do that which normal people can't. That includes people like the Environment Agency, Natural England actually has to licence itself to be able to investigate, to get into, to get into it onto premises and then to be able to pick up and um, take things, because otherwise it'd be committing the, uh, the animal. Uh, underlying animal offence. At the same time, we also issue, Natural England issued 3,251 scientific licences, normally those are to allow access to an otherwise protected area, for instance a burrow or um, a set or something, to allow um, research to be done into um, populations and changing the um, populations. And 17,000 bird, li um, bird licenses were issued to allow them to do other things, which include killing individuals. There are not statistics for badgers, unfortunately, but one thing we do know is two very large ones have just been grant granted. I'm not going to comment on that, and I'm not going to comment on the Hunting Act. The Hunting Act is outside my project. I cannot comment on current death of policy, however insane someone might think it is. And one of them is sitting sat over the grassy nose, it's quite a lot of them. Um, <laughs> The problem is, what we don't know, a licenses allow you to do something, which means that the activity says, it, the license will say you can do X to 20 birds. The problem is that we, it's almost impossible to work out how much people have exceeded X where it's 20 birds, and actually have taken 100 birds. Now, the activity looks exactly the same. You're not going to be able to tell it unless you're stood next to the person counting the number of birds. It's the same problem that we have with and the fishing boaters, or almost anything which works in this sort of, sort of thing. What we do know, and what I can say categorically, is a significantly, a, a very large amount of human activity, human individual um, relationships within, uh, sorry, human uh, animal relationships within the United Kingdom are governed by licenses of one form or, no, form or another. A vast swathe of stuff which we do, which we take for granted, happens because somewhere, there was a wildlife grant, uh, license granted. That might have been to allow the development, or it could be to allow the running of a train on Chiltern Railways, um, or to occupy, uh, to allow a wind farm to carry, carry on. And this is important, because this activity is conservationally very significant. The deviance, the minor deviance in the operation of a 
wind farm across its time, uh, across its time could have almost catastrophic uh, consequences on local bird um, distribution. So it's the sort of thing that you need to get right. But you're doing this within the framework of an essentially lawful activity, i.e. the state has decided you can operate a wind farm, we've allowed you to build it, but we've said the constraints, the criteria within which one operates the wind farm. Now, wildlife law. Um, as you say, this, this is a slightly incoherent law, but I'm just going to run very quickly through what we think that law does, because it's important to try and understand what we're left, what we're saddled with. You know. um, control. Um, the, I'm doing this historically, I'm not giving priority to, um, to, um, to these, with the exception of um, when I get to conservation, but that's a requirement of EU law as opposed to anything else. Control is the first thing which in wildlife law has ever been um, been to do. The oldest wildlife act, like, like acts within our ju jurisdiction, whether it's true and others, others were um, forcing people who owned land to kill things. That was the job, it was to control pests. Okay, so the first thing that it does, and this is still a theme in wildlife law, but ma mainly now for the purposes of um, controlling invasive non-native species. You know, that's what, it, that's what the, the law does. But it also does other things. Anyone who owns a piece of land, you are still under a duty for a couple of weeks more um, to control rabbits on your land. If you own a property, you should be controlling rabbits on your property. And you should actively be doing this for fine, by the way. I'm sure that I'm, I will take the money off you later, by the way. It's 250 quid each. I think that should buy me a couple of beers at the least. But the law still exists. It's, the, it, 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 it's possibly the least enforced law on the planet, the planet in that no one has ever been convicted for this. But the law says that any person who owns a property shall control the rabbits on that land. And if anyone's bored about it, it's in section one of the Pests Act. Feel free. Um, oh, unless you want to land in the city of London or in the Isle um, um, of um, Scilly. Um, other than that, you all owe money, okay? Right, good. Hmm. Look, we're, you know, we're a small organisation, and we're <laughs> this government cut back. So, um, <laughs> um, exploitation. This is actually still a significant portion of our law. So what large chunks of the law do, does is um, set up a right against another individual. So it creates a right to an owner of land to take something which they don't own, but is present on their land. So it creates a, a, a right in the game, and this is what game acts do. They exclude you, or the person who isn't the owner, or the person who doesn't hold the hunting right, actually, on relating to the land, from being able to take on that piece of land. If you do, if you take that animal, then you are a poacher, you are a criminal. So that's what the law, uh, the law does. It creates a defensible right to an individual. Welfare. Welfare, weirdly enough, not weirdly enough, but comes second, actually, in, the, in this list, because um, some of the um, welfare legislation is actually older than most of the conservation legislation. Um, surprised, surprised, it surprised me, but it actually it's, it's just the way that people got there, um, got, got there first. Um, this obviously has been going for quite a long time, so the RSPCA, well actually at that point, the, S, um, the SPCA was founded in 1824. Um, it was really relevant actually by the fact it was exactly 100 years later that um, the League was um, found, founded, but, yeah, so, so 1924 for the League. Um, the legislation currently on, on our books relating to this are the Protection of Badgers Act, the Hunting Act, the Wild Mammals Protection Act and the Animal Welfare Act. The, um, Wild Mammals Protection Act, so if anyone can find a use to that, um, then please, I'm open to it. We'll go more this for that one. It's, it was written to defend hunting. It's, it, it, was, it was designed as a bill to put out end hunting, and by the time it got through, uh, um, through Parliament, the one thing that it doesn't affect is hunting. Um, uh, but, uh, all you can say about that one is a very successful lobbying, I think. Um, and then conservation. Um, conservation for the purposes of the United Kingdom has to be the priority for certain areas of our law because we are required whilst we are still members of the EU. So the Wild Birds Directive and the Habitats Directive prioritise um, prioritize conservation over anything else. Um, actually, within the terms of the Habitats Directive, you can't even consider other things. So wild birds, you can almost weigh, weigh up um, the conservation interest against uh, the sort of social, uh, social economic and traditional uh, mechanisms, and that's because the, hunt, the Wild Birds Directive was focused specifically on hunting. It wasn't designed as a 
Catchall's uh, directive, what it turned out to be, it was designed to focus on uh, controlling direct attacks. So people running around in town uh, causing the, what was then catastrophic loss, and still is actually, of uh, farmland species, of uh, birds. And it, so it had a thing that it was aimed at. The Habitats Directive talks about much more general species, personally, and also things where the direct effect, the attack on the species and the conservation interest was of a much wider nature. So it includes cetacea, where the, 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 prob the problems with um, so, um, attacks on cetacea range from every, everything from occasionally, but they are still persecuted, although whaling has been banned for a very, very long time in this country and of most, of, most of Europe. Um, but from disturbance, the operation of shifts, the, the, the driving of them away from um, feeding grounds, that's, you know, that is essentially the core, the, a large chunk of the core issue, issue and therefore it's, it works in a different, different way. And the kind of conservation regime for the geeks and microstudies is located at the moment in the Wildlife and Countryside Act or the Conservation of Habitats, the Species Regulation 2010. You don't ever really need to know that. Now, the point about this is that the law is just incoherent. That all of these interests actually exist in our law. So, trying to focus, fashion a wildlife law when actually all of these things coexist, and some of them are and have very different responses for individuals. Welfare, for instance, you can't mitigate. You cannot mitigate a welfare. You can't say, I was nice to that fox, but I killed that one inhumanely. It just doesn't work like that. Conservation, however, is generally thought, but you can mitigate. You can move or improve. You can do an action in one thing and then replace it or do something else. I'm not going to massively comment on this because it's a very long-standing debate whether that's actually true. However, one, one thing is certain is that you definitely can't in welfare and you possibly can in, in, in relation to conservation. So they have different outcomes even at the individual level, potentially. And definitely that's the structure within the directives allows you to do something for a good, for a public good, where you have where you have no other satisfactory solution and you're going to do something else. So your, your, your world is very, very different to the hunting, the hunting act. You are hunting, you're doing something which is an evil sport and you shouldn't be allowed to do it. Government has stepped in and said you cannot do it. There's no part of hunting with, um, hunting with dogs which is legal. It's just all illegal. So that's very different in a way to a lot of the rest of the world. And that, that's where we get to sanctions. Now, I'm going to talk slightly, um, very quickly. How much am I down to? You, you're okay for about 10 minutes, I think. Cool. I'm not actually going to take that long. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk very quickly about criminal sanctions and then civil sanctions. Civil sanctions are a bit where you don't necessarily agree. Um, criminal sanctions would probably do. Um, crime pays. That's the best thing that I can say about um, the criminal law in relation to wildlife, it pays. Um, an exa a, re a recent example was almost perfect. Um, a man was convicted for the destruction of bat roosts, um, 700 pounds. The 700 pounds is significantly cheaper than it would have cost the environmental consultant to have moved safely and properly those bat roosts. The effect of that is essentially, and it's a, almost exactly the wrong message for any criminal regime, just go ahead, you know, even if you get caught, then quite simply it's still cheaper than having um, gone, about it, gone about it and paid the, consult uh, the consultant. And there's a high chance, because there's not that many wildlife crime officers left, that you won't get caught. On top of that, um, another, my, possibly my favourite example goes to, he's, he's called Mr. Onslow. I think he might have had something to do with him at some point, I can't remember. But anyways, this, this is a man who... Um, he works on the basis that an average family holiday costs about a thousand pounds, and he doesn't have family, but he's prepared to take that as his nominal figure. figure. So he um, goes to Scotland and he takes um, eggs illegally, um, and he adds to his, 
his collection, and he says, well, look, I get caught every three, four years. My fine comes out at two and a half thousand. That's the cost of my, uh, that's the cost of what I would have been my family holiday if I had to take him on a family holiday. This is how I tend, um, choose to spend my, my holiday time. It's fine. I don't mind. He is admittedly now banned from Scotland during the breeding season. Um, it might be one of the more unusual of the world's outposts. But again, it took four or five trips and two trips to prison for him to get to the point where he's now banned from Scotland. Um, again, wildlife law does have significant problems within it. In it. Um, there is the funding problem. The fact, there is also the fact that the number of species protected is huge. So you have to prioritise. The, you know, the National Wildlife Crime Unit has had its funding, funding uh, policing blood priorities are bats, badgers, CITES, raptor, persecu um, um, raptor persecution was one which I've just missed. Um, freshwater mussels. Uh, no, I thought it was freshwater mussels. And freshwater, <laughs> yes, freshwater <laughs> mussels. Um, and those are policing priorities. And if you're outside that, which 90 and lots and lots and lots of nines of wildlife is, then you're not even a policing priority within something where you don't have a recorded crime. So you're a, a non-priority within a non-priority. This does not look good for, the, for people investigating you. However, we do still think that there are problems with the area, but we can do something. One of the law commission report, um, um, points, and we've changed our, our view on this, um, is to make all crimes um, trial either way. We accept this is going to be a hit. It will be a monetary hit to the government because it is significantly more expensive to put a trial into the Crown Court than it is to the Magistrates Court. However, if you're only going to ever prosecute a hundred of these in, 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 in any given year, and maybe one of them, two of them, tip the balance where they should be in a Crown Court because you want the sanction, we think that's money well spent. We think that would be economically justified, and that the Civil Service, the Civil Crown Prosecution Service would be able to internally justify it as the marker, the deterrent effect. So you pick, you allocate, and this is what you are meant to use criminal law to do. And therefore, that's what we should, we should be doing. We think that that makes, makes sense, and we accept that that moves you from relatively cheap to more expensive. And more expensive. We also, however, think that there is a greater role to be played by civil sanctions. Civil sanctions, by the way, I mean those which are concurrently contained in the Regulatory Enforcement and Sanctions Act. And this essentially means the ability to issue fixed monetary penalties, discretionary remedies, stop notices, which might be my favourite, um, and enforcement undertaking. Stop notices um, tell you that if you can carry on breaking the law, you have to stop doing the activity which is leading to law breaking. Um, to take your, uh, your, the example of a non-compliant uh, game shoot, that means that because of ongoing raptor persecutions, you are no longer allowed to run a game shoot. I actually think that's a reasonable sanction. I think that that fits into the category of, you know, dissuasive. Um, whether you ever get one is a slightly different question. Now, some people have problems with civil san have sanctions, and not just the, the, the idea that it's decriminalisation, but I'll get to that bit, but also because they're issued by a regulator. Now, I think it's best to say that Natural England is not on the Christmas card list of a large number of people who are who call them developers, sales developers, or would cause uh, call themselves involved in the shooting and countryside sports, um, because they think they're a bunch of uh, conservationists. Um, on the other hand, the other side thinks that you know, Natural England is allowing too much to go on, so no one wins here. But there is an issue about here that you are, in a way, the judge in your own case. You have decided that X has done something, you know, that, that the individual has done something bad, and you are also imposing the sanction on them. Now, the, weirdly enough, the Act of, um, has already thought about this. Um, so there is an appeals process, but more importantly, I think that this is a better place to put some of these sanctions. Yes, if you're going into a, you know, you're going, you're going out and you're committing hunting, I think that that is the sort of thing that should be in a Crown Court. If you are going to spend two weeks explaining to South End magistrates what the acceptable level of bird strike is, I don't think anyone is going to benefit from that process. It's almost exactly the wrong place for it to be. The history of um, complex frauds in other bits of criminal law has been that 
when the law gets really, really complicated, actually you don't end up securing pro um, uh, prosecutions because it just becomes complicated. The CPS have to spend two weeks explaining to two magistrates, and I'm not really holding this against the mag magistrates, um, how, what is the acceptable level of bird death by running a, um, a, a wind farm? This isn't the sort of place that you want that, in all honesty. Um, and Natural England, theoretically, on the basis of they licensed the darn thing, probably should know what is the acceptable level of death. And more importantly, they have the information flow. They know what's on the license. Slightly more likely than your South End policeman is going to have to, to know what's on the license. They are the right people to, um, to deal with this. And then when it gets appealed from this, it goes to a dedicated specialist tribunal. It has to go to the first tier tribunal. There is now an environmental tribunal. The tribunal now that started having cases, um, it didn't for the first couple of years of its life, um, is now doing things. And it is building up that expertise and the expertise that it needs to be able to deal with what is a very, very co complex world. Now, we do have problems at governmental level. We are slightly out of step with government policy on this one. Um, government says that um, the current government doesn't like civil sanctions. Um, and most people think that, you know, um, criticise us because they think that we're decriminalising it. Um, the government thinks that we're handing over power to regulators who will stop people doing things which they should do, like you know, develop, putting in developments where they shouldn't. Um, we disagree slightly and think that this is not, uh, not an acceptable way to go about it because if you look at the regulated community, the, the proper thing to deal with large chunks of it, and not all, is this sort of methodology because it's within the context of a basically lawful activity which you're doing badly and you need correcting. You need to show what to do and in the end, otherwise we will just stop you doing it full stop. <coughs> but the current policy is with, sorry, uh, that wasn't me. <laughs> um, the, um, the current policy is we shouldn't impose um, civil sanctions on small and medium enterprises. That is something under 250 employees. The largest game shoot in the United Kingdom is not going to be 250 employed, direct employees. If, if I pick a really large estate, I will be lucky to get over 250 direct employees. So this, is, this just means that what you said is that you can't regulate the regulated community. Um, it also means that most consultancies, the people who actually said, you dig a driver, go and dig out that, the batch is set. Um, would be outside. 250 is actually quite a lot of employees for a consultancy. So we think that this is utter, utter rubbish. Um, so we um, think that we're, we're going to break that particular policy on the basis that we don't agree with it. Um, now, within consultation, there were definitely people who thought this led to de decriminalisation. And I'd like to address that one. It isn't. Um, firstly, the way that Regulatory Enforcement and Sanctions Act works means that you have to have the underlying criminal offence. You don't take it away. So it is always there as an option. Now, the query would be whether prioritisation would happen such that the, that the system would favour Natural England imposing a sanction above um, the police investigating and prosecute, um, prosecuting. And yes, I think that, that is a worry, and it is a worry which would have to be brought out in, in, in guidance. But there are, as I keep returning to, there are sophisticated ways of coming up, up with this, partly because it works on information flows. The whole, whole point is that Natural England are unlikely to know about poaching. The police are more likely to know about it, partly because of their relationships with yourselves, or the RSPCA, or um, I4, or partly because of um, um, so that, you know, that, that's the sort of thing. And then there's other bits where you want the marker. You, it, is, it ticks the box where um, it should be prosecuted. We already do this within um, environ other environmental sanctions. If you think of this as an environmental sanction, then the Environment Agency, which is both the imposer of civil sanctions and the prosecutor for a large chunk of environmental law, makes these decisions. And it does it within a coherent fra framework. Now, it's slightly more complicated in wildlife because, as I said, the environmental agency is both the prosecutor and the opposer of civil sanctions, whereas here it's a split in that the CPS is the prosecutor and the um, regulator is um, Natural England. 
But it really isn't beyond the wit of government to be able to um, write the document which allows this to happen. Trust me, you know, don't trust me on this one. Read the document if it ever happens and make sure it does it. Don't trust anyone because it might not do it. And that's wrong. You should be vigilant. It is a problem. It is a flaw. But it is much better to have those options and to have a complete regulatory framework than what we have at the moment, which is there is huge swathes of wildlife law, which is essentially unregulated. It has a law, but a law really isn't anything if it doesn't have anything behind it. And that's where we are for large chunks of the world now. And what one of the advantages of, the, of, of civil sanctions is filling in some of the gaps where these are never going to be policing priorities. The police aren't the people to do wind farms. They're not the people to do operating trains through tunnels and Chilterns. But natural England is. And that's the better way of doing it, I would suggest. That doesn't mean that hunting, which there is no part of hunting which, is crimin uh, which isn't criminal. Consequently, there's no part of it which can be fixed by a civil sanction. You can't go out and say, do, do your hunting in a compliant way, because there is no compliant way. So it's, it's absolutely the wrong thing for a civil sanction. They're designed for correcting behavior within a context of a set, essentially legal operation. So a development or a wind farm or, or operating boats. Finally, because I love, um, there's one last bit which I'm going to talk about, which is administrative, administrative sanctions. These almost all um, exist at the moment. General licenses, remember I said that a general license allows you to do X as a member of the public. Now, at the moment, 35 million pheasants are regulated not at all. The Game Act provides no regulation of the game, uh, the game shooting industry. It just says you can shoot them and it stops other people poaching them. That's all it does. Um, and it imposes a closest. We, that is non-compliant with EU law, by the way, and we want to fix that. And the, we, the way that we fix it is by issuing a general license to allow the hunting of pheasants, but with this one big caveat. Anyone convicted of a wildlife crime, anyone who fails to accord with wildlife crime, um, cannot rely on the general license. They have to be individually licensed. And that is a way of having a proportionate regulatory regime, and it already exists. We already do it for general licenses in other situations. If you're in the nice bit, then you can use the license. If you are on the naughty step, you can't. You have to be individually licensed to do those things which you would, if you haven't been bad, been able, um, be, uh, been able to do, which we think is a proportionate way of building a regulatory structure. It does what it should do, which is try and correct bad behaviour and allow compliant behaviour to go, go ahead. So that is our, our purpose. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to the Before I carry on, uh, as a slight plug, um, we've just launched our 12th programme, so if, oh, if you, any of you are illegally be, beating peregrines, by the way, no. Um, but other than that, we're open to suggestions on what to do next. <laughs> yeah, but that's one, one of the 12th, 12th programmes. I, I thought the two was overdoing it with slides. Yeah, Keith had originally planned to take a couple of questions. Yes, um, So, got a little bit of time, so if you want to take a few questions, uh, first of all, are there any burning questions? I may have to limit Joe to one or two, because <laughs> uh, I sense he has a few. And then we'll break for coffee. Yeah? Yes. Um, Keith, um, even if one is, was, was, was persuaded, and, and, and I may well be, um, by your sort of promotion of, of, of civil sanctions and, and, and building regulatory infrastructure, it seems to me it depends really what type, um, because when you talked earlier about it being possible to tell if somebody has exceeded the terms of their license because you're regulating you're regulating them yeah. through numbers, yeah. okay, and, you, and, that, and that's unenforceable. Yes. The problem is that those, those doing that know that, those doing it know that, and in most cases you imagine they, they would, yes. um, deterrence becomes sort of irrelevant. And Without actual enforcement, there is only deterrence. Yes. So you're then left with something where you have an entirely redundant form of control. And so that seems to me to apply to civil sanctions and, and regulatory infrastructure, depending on its type. Would that be inaccurate? I think it's a good point. Um, but I would, 
I, I actually think it makes no difference whether you enforce it through criminal law or through regular and civil sanctions. Your problem is whether you have committed an, an, an offence. I, if I hold a license, the license says I have, um, I, I can kill 80 birds. If the first bird, the 81st bird that I, I, I now kill, I have committed section one wildlife crime offence. So it makes, in a way, it makes no difference whether it's civil sanctions or whether it's enforced through the courts and the C CPS. There's no real difference between the, between the two. So it is actually a flaw in the, in the general system. And almost certainly the largest amount of non-compliance in wildlife law is, um, especially in licensed area, is um, non-compliance in numbers returns. And one of the things we do actually have to do is try and get uh, Natural England to investigate this. But that's a resources problem. And in a way, there's, no, there's very little that the legal system can do about, about that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an inherent fault in the, the activity in that we prohibit something, we allow you to do 80 of those things, and the first one um, is illegal. But that requires me to know that you'd done all of the, the 80 and used, used all of your, you know, your, your measure of allowed bird death. Um, it is a flaw with the regulatory regime in, in total. It's actually one of the problems which is a, an error in law in a way, because it's actually much better, I would suggest, to use funding or for large chunks of these activity to use CAP to, to try and regulate these activities. But it, I don't think that sanction, in a way, the sanction doesn't make any difference. Okay. Can I just follow up just to make quick? Yep. I mean, no, that's, that, that, that's helpful. And I suppose that the, the broader question is, is that without reasonable enforcement, the law is undermined because the deterrence is irrelevant. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Are there any other questions, Keith? Uh, yeah. Um, just, just a quick point on um, uh, criminal sanctions and deterrence. Um, just to explain my background, I worked at the uh, criminal defence and solicitor of yeah. violence, and we often defend people who are animal rights activists. Yes. And this issue of um, making criminal offences um, in terms of animal welfare law and making them either way, like, we would normally advise yes. our clients to, to, to elect crown court trial because, of course, the chances of acquittal are higher. I think a better way towards deterrence potentially be to issue quite forthright sentencing guidelines whereby, especially where, where there are repeat offenders, they, once a fine has been issued, the law allows for custody sentences straight away. And of course, the magistrate's courts have sentencing powers that up to six months for stable. I, I agree entirely, and it's it's going to make the impact assessment for this quite tricky because, absolutely, someone who, sorry, to those, those who, don't, um, who don't know, if you haven't tried the either way, you have the option of either being um, tried in the, center, uh, in the Master's Court or Crown Court. It is significantly more expensive to go to the Crown Court, and partly because of the availability of your jury, you're slightly less likely to be convicted. Anyone sensible being uh, prosecuted actually should elect, in a way, for the um, for Crown Court, I bet you take the gamble, the hit, but the sentencing is obviously um, the greatest sentence possible against against you. And the point being made, and I think quite, quite well, is that the sensible thing for people to do if they were being prosecuted under the Wildlife Act would be to elect to go to the Crown Court and hope that they a, now have a slightly more chance of getting away with it, and b, that the CPS might just not think it's worth the, the, the cost and they'll just drop the whole thing. And I think it's a very good point. We still think that it's worth having that marker in, in it, and I don't think I don't necessarily think the marker of a magistrate's court, even if say you up the, the, the fine to uh, the maximum possible in a magistrate's court, which I think is about fifty grand, isn't it? But six months of the most of the custodial sentence, you can't get an, uh, you can't use the, the act to undo the, the uh, magistrate's court act power. And so six months, and you're, just, you're still in a magistrate. I don't think the marker is sufficient just because it's in a magistrate in a way. Um, and that we did look at this, and it's a very good, good point. And we just, in the end, thought the risk was sufficient, actually. But yes, good point. I'll take one more question, and then Keith will be available for a further grilling later on. Uh, he will have a beer in his David? <laughs> <coughs> no, I just wondered because. There's a clear distinction being drawn between animals dying through firing into a wind turbine yeah. and then dying as a result of somebody going out with a gun. Yes. And I have no idea whether the numbers are just significant on one side or other of that or 
than uh, to sort of sensible distribution. Well, probably the largest number of um, birds death in the United um, Kingdom is holy eagle, which is will be uh, game uh, game shooting. Uh, Thirty. Okay. I, it, it's. I, I thought that that's all. Yeah, sorry, uh, pheasants. I was, I was yeah, going to go. Yeah, pheasants okay. and partridges is yeah. forty million. Um, of of those, actually, half of them die not by being shot, um, but are dying partly because of the conditions within, within which they're reared, or natural, just natural death across the they're admittedly only ever going to be quite short life. Um, but as to so shooting in a way, yes, there is an answer to, to your question, which is shooting kills more. If you talk about environmentally damaging, well, there's actually twenty. So. There's actually 34 million too many <coughs> pheasants in the United Kingdom. Um, the natural population of pheasants would be about a million, give or take a little, a little, bit, a little bit of change. So, in a way, you know, shooting a large chunk of them in, um, in the conservation terms has absolutely no, no effect apart from the fact that the things themselves might have a negative environmental effect because they take other things, they take food out of, an, out of a normal ecosystem. So they have problems, but they don't have problems by the fact that we've killed quite a lot of them. It's the fact that they probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. So in a way, yeah, wind farms win on that basis because they can have very significant effects. And especially with where you're getting now sort of a wall of, of um, wind farms, we're plugging up the gaps along the, the east coast. Great, I say, and I, have, I still have to go never each other week. This is not good. Um, but but and there's, there's quite a lot of quite, quite decent research going in on about the effect that that is having by tiring birds, um, because normally, actually, things don't fly into them. They tend to fly into them when they're, they're put in bad places or when the birds themselves are too, too tired to avoid. And there's actually some research, quite interesting research being done which I was reading recently about the effect that the wind farm, you know, sort of heated wind farms is having on um, avoidance and their and on birds. So that make any more sense. And well done for avoiding saying there's too many pheasants so it's okay to kill them. Um, <laughs> right, okay. If we can break the... Was uh, I likely to say that? <laughs> I, I feared that's where you were going. Um, I did catch myself, I almost said it. Yeah, nice recovery. Actually, <laughs> the, 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 crime, the crime is the shooters put them there in the first place every year. <laughs> I knew he wasn't going to let that go. <laughs> we can break there. We'll break there uh, for tea, coffee, and hopefully water outside. <laughs> and, <laughs> be, and come back in about three o'clock. But I'd like to just thank Keith again. <laughs> and, uh,